Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me. How are we doing today, Dame? I'm doing great, man. Excited for some basketball tonight. Last game was last game was great. Last game was amazing. So I'm excited to see what happens tonight, but I'm doing good. Yeah, last game was uh I was jumping out of my seat. I I feel <laughs> like that was one of the most exciting games of this postseason, at least I feel like down the stretch. It mm-hmm. felt like it was just big shot after big shot by both teams. So um excited to dive into that game and do our, our recap and you know look forward into the series because they all you know what they say, right? Like it's not a series until somebody a road team wins. Yeah. And a road team a was able now. to do that. Um, for the first time in Denver this entire postseason. So we're going to get into all things finals related. As always, we're going to get the housekeeping out of the way. If you are on YouTube, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Um, We appreciate the support as always. If you are listening on one of the audio platforms on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and drop a five-star review. Um, was looking at some of the analytics from the listeners, and we got listeners in New Zealand now. So... (laughs) If you are in New Zealand listening to this, we appreciate the support international. Um, right. That's a big thing. It's big love. We appreciate it. Um, but yeah, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into game two of the NBA finals. Um, like I alluded to at the beginning, no team this entire postseason has done what the Miami Heat were able to do in this game. And that is win a game on the road in Denver. Um, and they do it in, I would say, pretty thrilling fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of looked like it was they were running away with it a bit, a bit there at the end, but Denver not going down without a fight, even to the final buzzer. Had a look that honestly, until I saw it hit the ground, felt like it was gonna go in exactly. Yeah, I felt the <laughs> I, same exact way, <laughs> yeah, just with how the, the shots were falling for, for really both teams, especially down the stretch there. Um, but Miami evens up the finals. Um, with a 111-108 win, like I said, in Denver, being the first team to be able to beat Denver at home this postseason. I think that's the first loss that Denver's had at home since March, Yeah, which is I crazy because we are in June. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they were able to, to slay the beast and be able to get one on the road. And now they're going to Miami, the chance to take a serious lead in this series and have won themselves home court advantage. And now, you know, Denver is going to have to respond, but um, the big change going into this game, um, obviously we talked about it. Spo being the the best coach in the NBA that he is, we know he's going to make adjustments, right? From the get-go inserts, Kevin Love into the starting lineup um, brings Caleb Martin off the bench. Kevin Love had a great impact on this game, you know, only scoring six points, but had 10 rebounds, um, one assist, two steals in this game as well. He was a plus 18 from a a box minus perspective. Um, So didn't shot, didn't shoot the ball, you know, exceptionally well, but his size was greatly needed. Like we discussed from game one, they were just getting out, out muscled really with Aaron Gordon. Mm -hmm. So bringing Kevin Love, you bring Kevin Love in, having him take on that matchup, then, frees up Jimmy Butler to be able to get on to Jamal Murray more. Like we said, it's going to be all about disruption. Um, Jimmy Butler definitely had Jamal Murray um, in a more difficult position. Um, One of his lower scoring games in the playoffs here, um, only 18 points, seven to 15 from the field. Um, And I want to get into uh, after I kind of like we get your initial thoughts. I want to get into more about what you kind of talked about in last, last week's episode of, making Jokic a scorer or at least trying to take away the others because I think that's kind of become a large talking point especially with bolsters you know talking to the the reporter in the press conference saying that you know you can't make guys like Jokic a a scorer or a passer right like they do what like you can't force them into one they're always going to make the right basketball play Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen a lot of back and forth about that and I think both sides are right. The con- the conclusion is the same. It's about how we're getting to that conclusion that I think yeah. is getting to where, like the disconnect is, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I want to talk about that more, but I want to get your thoughts on this game as a whole first. 
Um, you know, what did you see from from both sides? What did you see from Miami that, that really was a difference maker between game one and game two and was able to get them the, this win here? Yeah, like you said, the, the biggest difference for me was the adjustment in the starting lineup, putting Kevin Love in there, um, having more size, stopping Aaron Gordon from just bullying everyone who was on the court in the first game. It just seemed like it don't matter who they had on him. He was just he was a mismatch size wise. So having him out there um, definitely was huge. Like you said, putting Jimmy Butler on Jamal Murray, being able to slow him down a little bit was def definitely big because we're going to talk about it more later. Jokic is kind of going to do whatever he wants to do. There's no one in the league that can stop Jokic. So it kind of doesn't matter who you put on him, what you do. He's going to score at will. But getting his teammates in ball involved is is I think pretty much his biggest strength offensively. So being able to take that way a little bit with Jamal Murray being able to slow him down is is definitely, definitely huge. Um, it helps that the role players from the Nuggets seem to go cold a little bit. Uh, Michael Porter Jr. didn't have a great game. I think KCP played horrible. Like he just, he, he wasn't hitting shots. He had two terrible fouls on three-pointers. One of them was like ridiculous. The one on Cal Lowry, was, yeah. he was way... He was he was way far behind the three point line. It was just it just seemed like a dumb foul. So he he didn't really have a great game in my opinion. I think even in the fourth quarter they he they took him out right for Bruce Brown. I think Bruce Brown played. I'm pretty sure he closed the game out instead of KCP. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, that that was big. Uh, for he having the role players for the Nuggets who seem to be playing great every single game, every single series. They seemed like they were just unfazed by whether they were at home on the road, who they were playing. It seemed like those role players were really stepping up. So I think that um. That was big for the Heat. I think Bam had a huge game. I think Bam, honestly, I think he played better in the second game than he did in the first game, even though in the first game he had a good one. I feel like in the second game he was a little bit more aggressive. Um, in the first game, I don't even think he shot any free throws. Miami shot two free throws. Yeah, goal, so. yeah, lowest free throws ever, I think, in a finals game. Exactly. So I think he was a lot more aggressive. And I, I, I'm liking the way Bam is playing right now, because even when it's not him scoring, it's like he's setting up plays for others. He's setting good screens. He's finding backdoor cutters. He's finding the open shooters. So they, I think the Heat overall just played a great game. The threes fell, which was a talking point we talked about in the first game, how the threes just weren't falling for them. So, um, yeah, it was big. Uh, Spolster did a good job running plays from Max Struess to start the game out, got him 12 early points, got mm -hmm. him going. So, yeah, it was it was a big win for Miami. It was definitely a big win. To be, to survive, I believe it was a 27 to, like, 6 run with Jokic on the bench for majority of that time is crazy because normally the Nuggets seem like they kind of they kind of stall out offensively when Jokic goes to the bench. So to be able to survive a run that they go on with him on the bench and still win that game, Massive credit to the Heat. So they they definitely won this one. Um, I'm excited for game three. Yeah, no, I think, like you said, we talked about the shooting in, in game one for the Heat was really bad. It was one of the biggest reasons why they lost that game. Um, it's been their, honestly, their most consistent theme throughout this entire postseason. Is their role players are just shooting the ball at an absurd percentage. Um, and when that doesn't happen, the Heat are look very, very beatable. Um, mm -hmm. But what we saw at the end of game one um, there in the fourth quarter, they were able to cut into that lead a little bit. Gabe Vincent hit some shots. Duncan Robinson hit some shots. Um, people seemed to get it going. Haywood, Haywood Highsmith as well. Um, and that seemed to carry over immediately, like you said, starting off game two. You get Max Schroes, um getting hot out of the gates early. Um, Gabe Vincent gets hot as well. Duncan Robinson came in with 10 points to start the fourth quarter. He had another one of his moments. He's mean mugging the, the crowd there <laughs> in Denver. He's flexing on them. His Heat team has a little bit. You can tell everybody is really bought in to the, the narrative of being the underdog. Everybody has a chip on their shoulder. Um, you know, some of that is definitely going to be credit to Spolstra and what, you know, they said they're showing him motivational videos in the locker room and stuff. And But you can tell everybody is really bought into that mentality of, you know, it's us against the world. Um and you see it even emanating out of the role players at this point, which is, you know, you, this is exactly what you want for guys to step up on the, the biggest stage. And so Duncan Robinson, they were having a huge fourth quarter. Um, that run was really big for them, kind of stretched their lead out a little bit, <clears throat> which gave them that cushion to kind of survive that last push there um, by Denver to, to, to end the, the fourth quarter and end the game there. Um, another thing that I think was really big for the Heat, like you said, the aggression. Um, from their entire team, really, as a whole. Like we said, two free throws um, from this team in the, the in game one, which 
you know, you're all, anytime you see that big of a free throw disparity, people are always going to go and rewatch the game, nitpick. This could have been a foul. This could have been a foul. But in reality, we touched on it, right? Mm-hmm. Jimmy Butler had like 10 less drives than he typically does. Who's the, mo- the main free throw shooter on the Heat? It's going to be Jimmy Butler, right? Exactly. So the aggression has to start with him. And he's immediately, again, much more shots in this game, um, more got to the line five times or had shot five free throws in this game, made all five of his free throws. He, as a team, shot 20 free throws in this game. So everybody made much more concerted effort to get downhill, go through contact, draw fouls, um, which is critical um, to being able to, to put away teams that are as high scoring as the Nuggets can be, um, being able to just get any all the points when you can. Um, so, so that was huge there. I think Jimmy, this game as a playmaker, um, was really good. Finished his game with nine assists. Um, again, it felt like not only was his aggression just from a scoring perspective, better driving and getting downhill, but he was utilizing that penetration to kick it out to these open shooters who, again, going back to the end of game one, now are getting back into the swing of things are hot. They're knocking down their shots. Now their offense is really um, getting cohesive again. So um, Mm -hmm. I think all of that was good. I really like what you said about Bam. I think he has played a a fantastic series so far, um, especially with all the pressure that's on him, like we noted on the defensive end, and then additionally continuing to have a good presence on the offensive side of the ball. He's always been a great rebounder, been a great screener, um, been a great kind of connector piece as a big to be able to be a playmaker um, for them. But – doing all of that while also putting up 21 points with all the defensive impact that he has, he's having a really huge impact on the series as a whole. 100%. Um, but what I really want to get into, um, like I, I touched on at the beginning is the idea of forcing Jokic to be a scorer because immediately after the game, um, Ramona Shelburne from ESPN asked Eric Spolstra, if that was a you know conscious decision that they made to to eliminate him from being a passer and trying to force him to being a scorer, and he cut her off and basically called her a casual in the <laughs> nicest way possible, right? Her untrained eye, <laughs> right? The, uh, the untrained eye, um, and, and that quote has gotten you know debated on ESPN. I've I've listened to JJ Redick talk about it. Um, I've listened to the guys at the Dunker Spot podcast talk about it, and. Just continuing to think about it, I think everybody is right in the situation. It's about how you're framing it up. Exactly. So, so saying that you're making him just a score is like an oversimplification of what's occurring, right? 100%. Um, like we talked about already, right? Bringing in Kevin Love, what does that do? Well, that eliminates the ability for Aaron Gordon to just get really easy mismatches off of switches. You have another big body on the court. Okay. What did that also do? That then allowed Jimmy Butler to pretty much match up on Jamal Murray for a much larger portion of the game that he was able to in game one. Those two things combined, what, what was one of the biggest things we talked about in game after game one that the Heat would have to do moving forward? Because you're never again going to stop this Nuggets offense. But the word that I used was disruption, right? Mm-hmm. It can't be easy, comfortable, free-flowing for them because that's when they operate best and that's when they're extremely hard to beat. Like you said, when everybody gets it going, they seem like unstoppable. Right. Jokic being cut from a similar cloth as LeBron in the sense that he doesn't make bad basketball decisions. Mm -hmm. If the right play is to be a facilitator, he's going to facilitate if the right play for him in this moment is to score, he's going to score. So the decision isn't just to say, well, hey, we're going to make Jokic score. The decision is we're going to make it hard. We're just going to have better matchups for everybody on the court. They played about the same amount of one-on-one coverage on Jokic as they did Mm -hmm. game one to game two. It wasn't like in game two, they were trapping him and doubling him like crazy. And then they were like, you're just on an island, Bam and Cody. You know, right. All of game two. They played the same coverage on him. The difference, like I said, is how they were defending the others to make their offense 
not as comfortable. What that then led to again is Jokic again making the right decision. One on one coverage on Jokic is a mismatch. So he ends up with 41 points, but he only has four assists. And like mm-hmm. we already alluded to, Jamal Murray had a low scoring game. Aaron Gordon had 12 points. Michael Porter Jr. had five points, two of eight from the field. The others didn't get a chance to really get it going because so much of that offense runs through Jokic being able to start it, right? Facilitate it, get the motion going. So the disconnect to me there is it's not about simplifying it just down to, well, we're just going to let Jokic score, but it's about getting everybody into proper matchups and putting yourself in the best position to just make it difficult for as many people to score as you as, as are on the court. Mm-hmm. The end result of that then becomes a one-on-one matchup with Jokic is probably your best bet. Exactly. So you have to pick your poison, right? You're always going to have to pick your poison in the playoffs. That's like one of the biggest themes, like force teams to beat you in ways that you think is best for yourself, that they won't be able to beat you. Um, and credit to Spolstra, I think that this is the, the kind of recipe that you have to have um, to be able to continue to try to win games in this series. Because, again, going back to what we've said multiple times, letting the entire Nuggets team get going, and Jokic has, you know, 24, 25 points, but he's got 14 assists, and Jamal Murray's going for 30, and MPJ's got 20, and Aaron Gordon's got 20. It's like, ah. That's a very tough team to beat. It's a different mm-hmm. story if Jokic is going for 40, 50, and the rest of those guys are, are struggling. They're not in a great rhythm. Um, you know, that leads to a completely different outcome. So, yes, I think it's not as easy as just making him a score, but um, I don't think – I just think it's an oversimplification, but nobody is wrong, right? Like, it's not yeah. a wrong way to try <laughs> to analyze the game. Um because that was a critical aspect of this game. And I think maybe the, 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 one of the biggest reasons why the result is what it is. Again, that's me lumping in a lot of different small changes in analysis and kind of overboiling it down to one thing, but they're all connected. So 100%. Um, I, I expect to see more of that um, from the heat moving forward. Again, looking to take out Jamal Murray as much as you can, having Jimmy Butler on him, who, to his credit, um, as physical as defense as he plays, does not ever foul. And I he know really this doesn't. because this is the second time I have lost my parlay because I always put his over on fouls. Because <laughs> you just figure, right, like he's got a, you know, a reach in here or there, a ticky-tack call. Mm-hmm. Nothing. He's does very not smart. commit fouls. He had no fouls in this game, and I think he played – really great defense for the entirety of the game. And a lot of that being on Jamal Murray. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I I think we're going to see a lot more of that from the heat continuing to try to, to find that matchup with Jimmy on Jamal Murray, continuing to run their two, three zone, continuing to run that two, two, one that they like a lot too, keeping Bam really low um, in the paint. So um, I think that they found something here that they can continue to utilize going forward in the series. And, Again, now they're going to Miami. Um, I think it's, it's Steve Jones at the Dunker Spot podcast says that the playoffs ask which team can answer a very specific question better. And in game one, Denver asked the question of Miami, what are you going to do to stop all of these weapons we have to throw at you? Now Miami has responded, right? They made those weapons a lot less volatile than they were in game one. Mm -hmm. So now Miami is asking the question, Mm -hmm. does Denver have an answer? Because if Denver has an answer, now they're going to be asking the question. And that's going to be the constant back and forth in these playoff series. So um, this is what we expected, right? Like the Heat were not going to be a pushover team. Um, Just from a a coaching perspective and how gritty they are, we knew that this was going to be a tough series. So um, I'm really excited for game three. I think that um, there's a lot to – Still adjustments to be made, a lot to still unravel in this series. So um, big response came from Denver coming up because 
going down 2-1 with another game in Miami, that is going to put them in a very precarious spot. So, mm-hmm. Big 100%. game tonight. 100%. That, this has been my favorite part about the playoffs. Like these little adjustments, that watching the coaches go back and forth, seeing the, the different adjustments teams are making to – counter counter what the other team is doing it, it's been my favorite part about these entire playoffs in every single series so far but yeah pretty much every I agree with everything you said um the key word for me was disruption disruption how they were trying to disrupt what nuggets were having going on with their whole offense and I think what's going kind of under the radar is the fact that it's it happened so early like obviously we talked about Kevin Love starting and then putting Jimmy Butler on Jamal Murray this and the third so it happening so early didn't allow for like KCP and Michael Porter Jr. to get it going from the jump because what just happened with Duncan Robinson with 10 points in the fourth quarter that can happen but that's not really likely right I feel like your stars can get it going at any point you know what I mean they're just big time players they can get it get it going at any point your role players normally it's like they have to be in a little bit of a rhythm like they kind of have to get, have it going early I feel like and then that leads to them having a good game all the rest of the time. If they miss a couple shots early or they just don't get into the flow of the offense early, I feel like it kind of takes them out of the game a little bit. And if they're not hitting shots, that could take away from their defensive intensity. So it's like it's a snowball effect. So the fact that they disrupted the offense so early, I feel like that was a, a key to these other role players not playing so well. Miami Heat ultimately getting the win. So um, it's funny. Uh, I, I think a lot of people think that make Jokic a score means – let him score. Like, it's not like, like, yeah, Jokic isn't going in like, all right, Jokic is going to get 40 tonight. Like, it's not like let him score. Like you said, it's just taking away the other options on the team because you know one person cannot beat you, even if he's scoring a lot. So he scored, I think, he scored 41 points. Right. He had four assists. He generated around like 50 points. In game one, I feel like he generated around like 65 points with his scoring and passing. So it's mm-hmm. a little bit different. It's like, yes, he's scoring more, but he's not generating as much points for the whole Nuggets team. So I don't know if I got an untrained eye, but, and also, by the way, I feel like a lot of that was just, I'm not going to tell you my game plan. I'm not going to be like, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. What so yeah, hundred percent. That's exactly what we did. We just made yoga to score. Like Spo is smart. He's not going right. to just agree to that and just give up his whole game plan. So he's going to make it seem like, Oh no, yoga is a great player. Like that's not what we're doing the whole right. time. That could be exactly what they're doing in the back. Just in a more, like you said, not as, as simple as, we're exactly. Gonna let score. Yeah. Spolster is smart. He knows what to say to the media. He's going to give you the, the diplomatic coach answer of, which is true to an extent, right? Like you reach a certain level of elite player. You mm-hmm. don't get to make them do anything. They exactly. are always playing on their terms and Jokic fits into that category, but they're always going to make the right decision. And if you're constantly making that right decision to be, take that one-on-one coverage you have against Cody Zeller, which is barbecue chicken. He was killing him. That was bad. He was killing That's what Cody he's going to take. Um, <laughs> but what it does, again, like a, a, a consequence of that, offense is less motion. There's not as much ball movement. It's pace slows down. It gets more gritty. It gets more tough. You know, physical, all things that start to lean into what Miami's DNA is. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's all everything is a very calculated decision um by Spolster here so like you said the watching these adjustments for for all these series and especially with both of these teams and these two coaches has been great this entire playoffs and so um I'm very interested to see if you were if you were Mike Malone right understanding this which I think is right like they're trying to make it hard for Jamal they're making it hard for AG you know any of these shooters to get going and leaving Jokic in this one-on-one situation, situation, what would you try to do to respond to that in game three? Honestly, it's tough because I don't think that it's as simple as like a lineup change, like how mm-hmm. it was for the Heat. It's not like, oh, we start Kemba Love that changes things. I think Nuggets have their set starting lineup that they're going to stick with. I don't really see a lineup change that's going to change anything. I really think it's just try to find a way, whether it's run plays for these guys, whether it's make it a point to get these guys going early. And I'm talking about the role players, basically. I'm talking about KCP. I'm talking about a Michael Porter Jr. I feel like he he especially kind of needs to get it going because he's been bad. I think even in the first game, he didn't he didn't shoot well in the first game either. So I just think it's you know you know Jokic is gonna he can get his his points whenever he wants. Jokic could have zero points through three quarters and end with twenty if he wanted to in the fourth. So it's like he can get it going at any point. 
I, I think Jamal Murray is at that point where he can have a bad game. He can have a bad, like, say, a couple quarters, a, a bad first half, and he can still get it going. I think mm-hmm. he's at that caliber of, of player. But I just think you have to do something, whether it's, like I said, run plays for these guys, but just make it a point to get these guys going early so that your whole offense is flowing and it's not just Jamal Murray, Jokic. No, Jamal Murray, Jokic, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I think that's the adjustment they have to make. I'm not a coach. I don't know exactly how you're going to do that, but I feel like that needs to be a focus. And early, like going, like yeah. started out from the first quarter. Like we've seen with Spo, Max Schuess didn't score. He was like 0 for 10 in the first game. Comes out the game two. We're going to make it a point to get him the ball, get him these open looks, and get him going. And you see what happened, 12 points in the first quarter. So I feel like that's what Michael Malone needs to do right now. Yeah, I, I would give them like the same kind of advice that I try to give to the gave to the Celtics in the last series, which is against any defense that is this difficult to run against in the half court, pace is always going to be the best medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Any type of speed, if you're pushing the ball with pace, fast breaks, or even off of made baskets, just like getting up the court and getting into actions quickly makes it a lot harder for you to just get into a set defense, harder for you to get into your exact matchups because they're already going, right? Like, you don't have time for all of that. So mm-hmm. um, I think the pace definitely has to get increased for the Nuggets, um, again, just because of how dominant the Heat are on the defensive side of the ball in the half-court setting. So um, – and, and it's beneficial when you have arguably one of the best full-court passing bigs in the league, yeah. it's both of them in this series, him and Kevin Love. Right? I'm about to say, are you talking about Kevin Love? Right. Right. <laughs> but, but you have a, a, like one of the best outlet passers probably ever. Um, and great, great in transition off the rebound as well, not even just outlet passing. Like he can get the rebound himself and then push the pace himself. So he's great at that as well. We saw him in this game grab the rebound coast and coast. go coast to coast and Man. finish one of the sloppiest looking layups I've ever seen. But it's like it's effective. He every every single game at this point it feels like he does something that's like, man, you should not be able to do this, right? Like it just exactly. doesn't look right. Um, like you are dribbling down a full court in the NBA against one of the best defenses, and it's just like effortless, right? Like with mm-hmm. your left hand. Right? <laughs> uh, Jalen Brown could never. <laughs> 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 um but but yeah he just is so otherworldly talented and like get, getting to ha- watch him showcasing on this stage i think i think they said it on the broadcasting game one like it's weird to think but there are nba nba fans your sports fans in general right who don't follow the nba like that but they'll watch the finals and this may be the first time they're ever really watching Jokic play That is true. And to watch his center do the things that he does. If you've watched both of these games, you've seen him be an absurdly dominant player from a facilitating standpoint. Consistently, he's a great rebounder. And then in this game, you saw him dominate as a scorer. You saw him handle the ball as a seven-foot big, score in a variety of ways. Um, I imagine that experience, like watching him for the first time, is probably mind-blowing for what – is like what is this guy? He's a freak. He doesn't look like he's supposed to be doing this. I watched the possession. He had the ball at the top of the key, dribbled, went behind the back on Bam, and like he almost got the end one. I was like, bro, what is like what is this? Why are you this big but can move so fluently? And like his footwork is amazing. Like he's just he's just crazy, man. He's just crazy. Best player in the league right now. Yeah, easily, easily the best player in the league right now. Um, we've got game three tonight in Miami. Um what is your your prediction for this game? You don't even necessarily have to give me a, who you think is going to win, but, like, how you think the game is going to play out. I think you're going to see a way better uh, – I, I think you're going to see better effort from the Nuggets. Uh, Mike Malone talked about it after after the game. Basically said how his team just – they didn't quit, but, like, they just seemed like they didn't have the same effort as Miami. And you could kind of mm-hmm. see there was a lot of times where Miami just seemed like they were real, real scrappy in game two. Right. Like, they were – hustling for rebounds like there was a I remember a specific possession where just normally Jokic would get this offensive rebound I think it was a a missed three or something like that and Max Strews came from out of nowhere it seemed like just flew in and and tipped it back and I didn't even get the rebound but just the fact that they're all team rebounding they're all hustling they're all rotating they're all giving the same amount of defensive effort um 
I feel like they just they outwork the Nuggets in game two. So I feel like in coming in game three, I feel like they're gonna make a make it a point to have a way better effort and way better intensity, whether it be rebounding, whether it be on the defensive end. So I just think you're gonna see a more locked in Denver Nuggets team than you've seen in game two. So and like I said, I, I feel like Michael Malone will we'll clearly see that we need to get our other guys going. Like I said, Jokic can score whenever he wants. Jamal Murray, he can score. He he still can score at will. I know Jimmy Butler made it a little tough for him, but he's still a, a talented enough player that he can score pretty much whenever he wants. So I think you're going to see them actively try to get the Michael Porter Jr., a KCP, get those guys involved so that it's not just the Jokic and Murray show. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to your point about the effort, right, the Miami Heat were in the bonus, I think, with nine minutes left in the in the fourth quarter of that game. Mm-hmm. Um, and just a lot of really bad fouls. I know you already talked about the KCP one, but – a lot of just dumb fouls um, mm-hmm. by Denver. A lot, a lot of and ones that they were giving up. Just soft fouls, reckless fouls, unneeded fouls, um, and all of those free throws add up. Again, it's a three point game, right? You think about even just the one foul that KCP had, at, you know, on the three point shot by Lowry. That's three points you're giving up right there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. That's a a huge emphasis, I think, going into this game. They need to, like you said, they need to be playing with better effort and needs to be, like, contained, right? has to be smart. Um, You can't be out of control with it um, because you're going to now, now you're on the road, you're going to be in a hostile environment. This Miami crowd is going to be, they're going to be rocking. Rocking, yeah, Um, (laughs) they're going to be rocking. So I I honestly, like, I do not know who I think is going to win this game tonight. It feels like a toss-up. It can go um, either way. I don't I'm think there's a clear winner. Yeah, I'm still confident in my pick that I think the Nuggets are going to come out of this series winning. Um, but dropping one at home, at least this early, is not something I thought Denver was going to do. Um, so definitely makes it tougher for them. Um, so getting – obviously, they, they need to get a split here in, in Miami. Yeah, um, because definitely. going down three one is we're entering very uncharted territory of an eight seed is about to win the NBA finals if that gets to that point. So um I don't even think you can I I mean you can go down two one, like you can lose tonight and be fine. You just yeah. have to win the next one. But I just I wouldn't even want to go down to uh, one to two. I, it, I just, yeah, if you have to, if you're going to get a split and you get to pick which one, tonight would definitely be the one because then at least it's like, all right, when we lose the next one, we have home court. We need to Best win game five three, and game yeah. seven. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's got to be like top priority number one is to get one in Miami. If you get both, fantastic, but like you got to be able to get one. Um, like you said, tonight I think would definitely be the better one. So excited to see what happens tonight in game three. Um, as always, tune into the Off the Glass podcast this weekend. We're going to come at you with the, our recap of game three tonight and previewing game four soon. So um, we're going to go ahead and get into some of the more of the rumors that have been coming out um, this offseason, which I swear sometimes they're pulling stuff out <laughs> of thin air because I can't believe that these even become stories. But <sighs> let's get into it, man. Um. The biggest one over the last couple of days, I believe first reported by Shams from over with the, uh, I believe the athletic or stadium, um, mm-hmm. saying that Kyrie Irving is attempting to recruit none other than LeBron James to come to the Dallas Mavericks. So not what has been reported for the last few months, speculation around the Lakers trying to get Kyrie He's now flipped it on its head, and he's trying to get LeBron to come to Dallas and to team up with Luka and uh, build a team there that plays no defense. But No defense, no depth. Boy, would they be hard to stop. <laughs> Offensively. Oh, yeah. You're not guarding them at all, yeah. but they're also not guarding you. So, I mean, I, I'll talk about it from a – I'll talk about it from a – can this even happen standpoint? And then we can get into like, say it in some world, say this happens and then what it actually would look yeah. like. But from a, can this even happen standpoint? Absolutely not. It's literally impossible. Like right. <laughs> it's literally impossible for this to happen. Like LeBron, will have to, I think LeBron will have to get bought out 
for this to even be a possibility and then traded. Or they, yeah, or they do a trade. With the, or trade. What do the Mavericks have to exactly. give? That, bro, they have no, they don't barely have any picks. They have no players we want. Let's just send in me Luca. I'm, listen, the conversation starts at Luca Doncic, <laughs> and I know they're not doing that. So this, this is just dumb. Like it's not, it literally cannot happen. It's like you don't want Tim Hardaway Jr. Over LeBron James? Nah, I'm straight. <laughs> Give me Tim Hardaway Sr. in his prime <laughs> and junior, and maybe his answer is still probably no, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, this is. I I think that this is a like. I seen some takes that this is a leverage play for Kyrie Irving or something like that. Not not necessarily leverage, but he's like, I'm showing. I don't want to fully say I completely want out of Dallas, but I also want LeBron to know that I still want to play with LeBron. So it's like, here, why don't you come play with me in Dallas? Knowing that is not gonna happen. It can't even happen because, like I said, I don't think you can. He can fully just say like, I don't want to come back to Dallas like at all. I think he yeah. still wants to be a Laker, but. I do feel like he also is maybe trying to send a message to the Lakers saying, like, if I come there, I'm not taking a pay cut. I'm not taking less money. I still want this long-term deal. Like, I still want to get paid. I mean, I believe that a little bit. That could be the only reasoning as to why this story would get leaked. So I think that's the only real reasoning as to why they would come out with this story. And it's weird because Kyrie's like, oh, I don't believe everything you hear. I'm like, bro, you said that. You told <laughs> You told them to leak this, bro. I'm not hearing that from you, bro. You said the <laughs> same thing when you were talking with Kevin Durant in, like, the tunnel, and they were like, oh, my God, they're talking about teaming up. He was like, bro, what? This is the problem with being an NBA player. People always make up stories, and then that's exactly what happened. Like, right. I'm not listening to Kyrie, bro. Kyrie's a liar, bro. I'm not listening to him, bro. Um, yeah, look, like you said, I there's no world, I feel like, where this happens. It feels like a leverage play, like you said, just trying to continue to stir the pot. Um, I think to even make money match, right? Like the, the, the offer would have to start on the Dallas side of things with um, Davis Bertans, Maxi Kleba, and Tim Hardaway Jr. Ew. Which, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that does not seem like fair packaging for LeBron James. They don't really have picks. They gave up a lot of their picks to get Kyrie in the first place. Mm -hmm. um so they don't have a ton of draft capital unless they're looking to at send in guys like josh green and Jaden hardy like really young pieces but then again it's like ew the lakers aren't trying to go young like they're still no. in now mode so I, I just don't see a way that this this gets done i think it's more like you said just continuing to keep stuff relevant in the media just adding a little bit more drama, trying to keep forcing, you know, the hands of the decision makers there for the, the Mavericks and the Lakers. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't believe the headline when I read it. Now I'm seeing LeBron and all these Mavericks jersey photoshops. Bro, so that nice, doesn't bro. look right. <laughs> Why would he want to go to Dallas when his son just is about to go play in California? Yep. They, he loves in L.A. Like, bro, and I'm not even talking from a Lakers fan. I'm just being, like, realistic. Like, why would he want to go to Dallas? Like, I don't – no, that's not happening. Like, you you seen – did you see the report that they were saying that Dallas said that they were going to make a trade package for LeBron during the season before we, like, flip the season around? Which yeah. also doesn't make sense because LeBron can't be tra – he couldn't have been traded this year. Like I do to like some like his contract or something like that. He couldn't have been. Yeah, there. after you sign an extension, sense. there's like a period where you like you kind of have like a no trade clause almost. Mm -hmm. Um. So that so, doesn't make sense. Like what? Somebody, somebody's lying. Like right, I don't yeah. know what's going on. Somebody's lying. That's all I know. Yeah. So we don't even gotta spend too much time on it. It's it's not happening. Just no something to keep the new cycle going, right? <laughs> but if it if it if it was to happen. I still don't think they're – like, who's playing defense? Like, you know, They have the all of the same problems that they <clears throat> have currently. And it's exactly. probably worse, right? Because, like, who's your best defender on that team right now? Josh Green and Maxi Kleber. And you're going to have to give away one, if not both of probably those Probably both, guys. if this was, if it was to be a trade. So. Right. So, who That's is crazy. playing – who's coming off the bench? Like, you are signing <laughs> vet minimums to fill out your no. roster. Nothing but vet minimums, and you're gonna have a aging LeBron and a hurt Kyrie Irving. This would be, bro. Who's guarding? 
who's guarding anybody, bro? It would be terrible. That team is that team is not winning a championship. I don't care how talented they are offensively. That team is not winning a championship. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, speaking of another guy who has um, been in a ton of offseason rumors lately, um, Shams also reporting that James Harden is, quote, torn on returning to the 76ers and is seriously considering joining the Rockets in free agency, um, which I know we kind of touched on it before, um, but it seems like he is seriously weighing this decision to go back to Houston, um, which, again, would be telling about what he's looking for at this point in his, in his career. Like, if you go to Houston, that's fine. You're not looking to chase a championship. That's okay. That just is the reality of that, that kind of move, right? Mm -hmm. um so interesting to continue to see how this plays out um there's been reports that he was a large factor in doc's firing so you would think that would give some indication that he's wanting to stay in philly exactly and if i'm 76ers brass or ownership i would not be letting a, a free agent give me any type of input like, on coaching, these I, I'm not gonna lie, these organizations gotta stop listening to the players, bro. They, they gotta stop listening to the players all the time. I understand when it's your best player, some you have to take in uh take into account their feelings and and what right. they what they feel. But a lot of times, bro, these players they just they gotta just stick to playing basketball, bro. Making these teams and constructing these teams. That's that's not what they get paid to do. But as far as like James Harden, whether he's going to Houston or Philly, like you said, it's really just whether do I want to still try to win? Do I want to just make money and ride out my career and just be a Houston legend? Uh, continue being a Houston legend that I already am. So yeah, I mean, hey, I can't fault you. He tried to do the he tried to go win a ring. He tried with Brooklyn. He tried to go with Philly. I mean, it didn't really work out. I feel like you still have a chance. You know what I mean? I don't think that he's completely washed. I, st I think he's still a good player. He's just inconsistent in the playoffs. But right, he's just ne he's never gonna beat those allegations at this point of being nah, a playoff it's, choker. There's too much, too much data right now saying I mean, otherwise. Outside of you know a couple of games in Houston, mm -hmm. um, but even in some of those series, it's like. Man, if you would have just had a better game, and then anything after Houston has been like, bro, Brooklyn was a mess. Both years in Philly now have been a mess in the playoffs. So mm -hmm. his best day, his best days are behind him, bro. Did, I seen something that they were like, oh, maybe, maybe he wants to go to Houston. Maybe he just misses being the guy. And I'm like, I don't really, I don't. That doesn't make sense. So this is not the same Houston Rockets team. That does not make sense to me. He he would maybe be the guy in the sense that like he immediately goes to Houston is is the best player on the team. Mm -hmm. But from an organizational standpoint, Jalen Green is still the guy. He's just like that's he's in development still. It's just mm -hmm. like you'll be the the guy. Like you you can score the most, right? You're the best player. But we all know what the focus and direction of it is. We're not building around James Harden. You're building right. around Jalen Green and Jabari Smith. And then mm -hmm. whoever you bring in this year, um, which perfectly leads me into the next rumor, <laughs> uh, which is that more and more has been coming out that the Hornets are getting pretty set on taking Brandon Miller at two. Um, I don't agree. Which – Makes things more and more interesting for Portland and Houston at four um, with potential for trades, potential for either of those teams getting um, what in many years would be a consensus number one guy to a lot of people in Scoot Henderson. Um, it, falling to a pass two, um, which leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you that I've seen a lot of people talk about because of these rumors, which is, at what point do you take fit into account when you're drafting, especially when you're in like the top five or top three picks? Do you always just take best player available, right? So if you're in this case, right, you're the Hornets, you're concerned about drafting another point guard because you have LaMelo. 
even though to, in most people's eyes, Scoot Henderson is the better prospect, mm -hmm. better talent. So at what point does it make sense to go for fit over talent? To go for fit over talent when the talent isn't at that top level. You know what I mean? I feel like definitely these picks one through three, you don't go for fit these this early. In this draft specifically, probably one through five, because there's a lot of good players in this draft. I feel like if it's if it's a draft that it's like it ha yeah, it has one top guy, maybe two top guys, and the rest are like they're going to be solid NBA players and maybe you go for fit. But when the guy has the potential to be the leader of your franchise or at least has a talent to be like a franchise leader, you don't go for fit. Like that doesn't make sense to me. Like you said it before. It's the same. The only reason they have LaMelo Ball is because the Warriors went for fit right? instead of going for the talent. It's like you don't go for fit when you're at that point of the draft. If this is picks 10 through 15, 15 to 20, through 20, okay, go for fit. That's fine. But it's like, you don't go for fit this early in the draft. Like, I don't get it. I feel like that's how you end up making a big mistake like the Warriors did. So that, that to me, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I think there's been so many instances where it just is, it feels like a lose-lose situation in, in, in a lot of these cases because if the talent does turn out to, you know, pan out to most of their potential or exceeds whatever they were expected to be, the pick before them is always going to be looked at as the wrong pick. As Portland, I, I, Portland itself, as Portland with, with the Michael Jordan draft, was right. a good idea to go for fit. That's like, exactly as, what as I'm Portland. talking about. God was, I just was rewatching the last dance and they were like, okay, Hakeem is number one. That was like clear cut. Cool. Mm -hmm. Portland has Clyde. They don't want to take another shooting guard. So they oh, went with yeah. the center and they took Sam Bowie and then passed up on at minimum, like second best player of all time because and they then, were for fit. And then years later, to win his champ, win a championship, who'd he beat? Portland and Clyde Drexler. Because Clyde got dominated. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you'd rather have Michael Jordan. So it's like, don't, don't go for fit that early in the draft, bro. Please don't. Just yeah. draft the best player. I think the Hornets. I'm, and I haven't watched much of, much of Brandon Miller, so I'm not saying he's a bad player or anything, but I just think I have seen Scoot. I just think he's, like we said, in any other draft, a number one overall pick caliber of player. And you don't pass you don't pass up on that just for fit. It's interesting, like, being – or, like, just following people that do draft analysis. There always reaches a point in the – the off season, like after the college season is over, once like we're a few months out of the draft, people really start putting together mocks, doing like real deep analysis, getting everything situated with their final rankings. There always is a large group of people who overthink it and rank it. Mm -hmm. Like what has been consensus for months, like for so long, it was Wemby, Scoop, easy, no questions right. asked. Like that is. The, once, like, the draft starts at three, right? We already know who's going one and two. And then, I don't know where you got people saying, well, you know, I have Brandon Miller at two, or, you know, oh, the Thompson twins, one of them might be higher than schools. I've seen people drop school down to, like, five. I'm like... School goes to five? That would be... Detroit would be... Oh, my <laughs> God. Like, oh, my God, they just went from the worst draft lottery luck ever to we still got our, we got a better a better than we thought we was going to get. Right. That would have been crazy. Um, but it's like there's just – there's no way that would happen. So it's like what, you the people start nitpicking and trying to find things and, like, talk themselves into these arguments to put people higher than – again, we've seen it for months now. It was It was not even a question. Why are mm -hmm. we trying to make it a question where there's, there's not even been a change. Like there's no more games that were played. You're just like rewatching the film over and over, trying to find something to convince yourself. Otherwise um, people latch on to these little things and you know, now they, they gotta be different, right? It has to be changed. But um, I think look, if I'm the Hornets, I don't care that I have LaMelo. I'm taking scoop. I think the two of them could probably play together. Exactly. And even if they can't, that's a you deal with that later. 
You, you can never have too much talent, bro. Right. You, you can never have talent, too much talent. The worst, the absolute worst thing that happens, you trade him for people that fit. Exactly. So it's like you'd rather have Scoot and be able to trade him than not have Scoot. Cause it's like, and then say Scoot turns out to be this great player that we all think he is, and say Brandon Miller not is not a bust, but like he isn't the player that you draft that you would have drafted at number two. Now you're stuck in a horrible spot. It's like that doesn't make sense to me. But right. yeah, that they always that happens with all drafts in every sport. They just happen with this football draft with the quarterbacks. It was like four different quarterbacks people thought was gonna go first, even though the consensus at the end of the season was Bryce Young one, CJ Stroud two, and then. Come draft talk time, bro. Every combination in the Anthony world. Anthony Richardson, Will is, Levis, like every everybody. combination. Yep. It was like, oh, maybe they'll just pass up on a quarterback and go defense. Like, bro, what are we, what are we talking about? That that doesn't even make sense, bro. Like, people just be bored in the offseason. I think that's what it is. People want to be bored. They want to make change, like you said. They want to be different, like you said. And it's like, bro, we could just keep the consensus the way it is, bro. Right, because. There's no need to overthink some of these things. It's no need to overthink some of these things because history has told us that when you do, you're going to regret it five plus years down the line when you're like the Warriors looking back saying, I can guarantee you that whole organization wishes they took LaMelo and say to, instead of James Wiseman. And that's mm-hmm. no shade to Wiseman because I think he got the short end of the stick in, in Golden State, but end of the day like right now just based on what we've seen from the two of them every organization takes Lamelo 10 times out of 10 you you figure mm-hmm. it out you make it work so exactly. like you can make it work with Lamelo and school because i guarantee you if Lamelo had been in golden state they would figure something out 100 percent. so 100 yeah. percent. it's crazy because they make like you made the consensus when the season was happening so you're watching these guys play what between when the season ends to now has changed? They're not playing basketball. Like, what is changing? Like, I'd, I'd understand if, like, Brandon Miller was still playing and he was killing everybody, then you're like, oh, maybe we should take it. They're not playing basketball. You ended their season with yeah. him at three. What changed from, like, what changed from then? And I get it. Like, you, the season ends, you do deep dives on film. You're watching, you know, game tape of them over and over. And you find and you see different things. But it it just – it feels like out of nowhere, like you said, they're just they – got to shake it up. Got to shake mm-hmm. it up. And it's like it, – it wasn't even a debate. Like we were – like I said, genuinely it was like school is a number one pick in any other year but this year. Mm-hmm. Like he's that type of level of talent. So how does it become that he's sliding past three right. with nothing – nothing different to show for it? Like it wasn't mm-hmm. like he came out – had a bad game, struggled doing X, Y, Z. Had off the court stuff. Like, no, it's right. the same. Nothing's changed, bro. So, yeah, look, I, I'll always be a big, big believer in you always, like 99.999% of the time are taking the talent over the fit unless you are like the NB, defending NBA champion and you had traded for a pick that all of a sudden becomes like the number three pick in the draft. And it's like, mm-hmm. right, like, it's a little bit tougher there. And even then it's like, why not just take the guy and figure it out? <laughs> like exactly. it always seems like if you believe in your coaching staff, you believe in the, the philosophies, the development staff, y'all will make it work. Like y'all can make it work. So, just draft the best player, bro. It's that simple. That, that's the whole point of the draft is to draft the best player. Like is that it's a simple process, bro. Right. Um <laughs> speaking of the the Warriors too. Uh, Steve Kerr went on Draymond Green's podcast and, and broke down game one of the or game one and game two of the Miami Heat uh, Denver series. Um, and he gave a quick about a minute soundbite where he praised the Heat's role players. And it seemed like he was specifically talking about guys like Duncan Robinson, who, again, had fallen out of the rotation, um, had every reason at that point to really check out. But committed, stayed locked in, and now that his number's being called again, is playing huge minutes for them in the NBA Finals like he was, um, you know, in the bubble and when he got that $90 million contract. At the same time, taking a dig at the young guys on the Warriors roster saying that, you know, the team that they had this year 
they didn't have those type of guys, guys that were committed and bought in, didn't care about their minutes. You know, they just, you know, were team first. He felt like that was lacking out of their young guys this year. And that sounds like a pretty specific dig at guys like Jordan Poole and Jonathan Kaminga and maybe Moses Moody as well. So mm-hmm. I just want to know what your thoughts are on as a coach going out and saying that publicly, like I get that it can come off as like you're challenging your players, but to me, it seems a little off base and I'm professional to an extent to do that on a podcast with a vet on the team who ain't exactly the, the most disciplined off court with said young guys. So exactly. So, um, yeah, I just want to know what your, your thoughts are on that because that really was interesting to me. It rubbed me the wrong way. I think that what he's saying can be looked at as bad for the organization as well because what is some what is one of the main reasons why a lot of these players on the Heat, these role players, are always locked in. They play. They're always connected. They're all. They're such a a good team as far as chemistry, as far as all having one goal. It's because of the Heat organization. It's because of the Heat culture. It's because of Spo. It's because of Pat Riley. All of them, they build that culture. They preach that to all of these guys. So you could say, isn't that kind of your fault? Isn't that kind of the Warriors organization's fault as to why these guys aren't locked in, as to why these guys don't have just one goal, and that's winning, and that's winning a championship rather than your minutes or who's getting paid and who's not getting paid. So I feel like it could be looked at as like bad for the organization, even bad on Kerr himself for ha- not having the guys focus on one goal. Now, I understand that, like, all players are different. Like, Duncan Robinson's undrafted. A lot of these guys are undrafted on the Heat. So it's like they do have a, a different type of, like, uh, I want to say, like, grind to them, basically, because, like, they mm-hmm. had to work to to get to where they're at right now. A guy like Kaminga, he was a lottery pick. It's like, so I can see why he might be a little spoiled as to, like, oh, I feel like I should be playing the way I like, as high I was as I was drafted. I should be playing. So, like, the person can be different. But I feel like the culture sets the tone. Your best player also sets the tone. Like, Jimmy Butler is the best player. He has all these guys as focused, as locked in, and focused on one goal as he is. So it could be looked at as bad on, as, for the player, but also for the organization and for the coaching staff and for that whole just culture they have in Golden State. We talked about this a few episodes ago after the Warriors were eliminated, that we both felt like, their young talent was not developed properly. They were not utilized properly. And when we got to the stage, they weren't ready. Mm -hmm. So to your point, a lot of that blame for what Kerr is talking about here, their, you know, their attitude, um, their approach to it, how they're taking, you know, their lack of minutes. That is hard. Like a lot of that blame has to go to you Mm -hmm. um, because they're, there's a whole lot of time in the regular season to get these guys more opportunity, get them confidence, bought in, all of that. And you're teetering that line kind of similarly in a way to what Portland has been doing, where you're trying to be in a win now mode. Your Steph is playing some of the best basketball, if not the best basketball of his career. But we also have these young guys on the roster. We got Jordan Poole, we got Moses Moody, we got Kaminga, we had Wiseman how do we win now and get these guys ready to be the future? I would say personally, I think that they are failing at doing that right now. Um, mm-hmm. In the sense that obviously, yes, they won the championship last year. So, and they're still in a place to continue to contend in the West. But you've already had to trade Wiseman because that didn't work. Kaminga, what does his role look like moving forward? He may potentially have to get traded. I think Moses Moody has had spurts this postseason where he looked really well. Jordan Poole, I'd say, regressed from last year. His role looks very uncertain. He looked unplayable for a lot of the playoffs. So your future is getting mortgaged right now when you had the, you had opportunities to try to integrate these two and let these guys kind of start out and become role players in the system and grow and develop to be larger pieces of the system when you start to phase out Curry and Clay and Draymond, you could have the seamless like changing of the guard. Obviously that's easier said than done, but that was clearly their mindset going in. And I, I would say they just have not 
been effective at doing that. Um, and like I said, it's already cost them one of their core pieces of young talent. Now, James Wiseman goes out in Detroit, <clears throat> obviously <clears throat> coming out of Memphis, you know, played what one game in college or didn't play in college at all. Like he's a very raw prospect. They knew that going mm-hmm. in. Um, but if he's able to develop in Detroit or if he moves and is just continue able to develop and get minutes and turns into a very quality NBA player, that would be looked at as something like, dang, if you could have only have kept him. Right. Exactly. Um, so they've got to find ways to utilize these young pieces to get them bought in, get them minutes and get them developing because Curry's only getting older. Clay's only getting older, older. Draymond's getting older. Iguodala is retired. The pieces of this dynasty are going to have to bow out shortly, mm-hmm. right? Like they can't stick around forever. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they're not really seriously valuing this young talent that they have, they're going to be setting themselves up for a much larger rebuild than it should have been based on, you know, having that one really bad season, you luck out and get the number two overall pick. You still get lottery picks with Kaminga in the following year. And it's like, you're kind of squandering it. Mm-hmm. When that was like, at the time was viewed as like, bro, this team still has Steph Clay and Draymond and had a number two pick. They're going to have two dynasties. That's what like, that's what people were saying. Like, right. They were like, he's going to last forever. Exactly. And that has not come to fruition. So, yeah, I, I it just, I didn't – I don't like it from a from a professionalism standpoint. Like, that's not a conversation I feel like you have on a podcast. I understand that Draymond is all about, you know, peeling back that curtain and just, like, being upfront and honest about stuff, but not there, right? Like, not – especially not with young guys, right, like, who your whole thing is about their attitude. That's not going to help the situation. If anything, you're only making it worse. They should have um, talked about how Jimmy Butler doesn't punch his role players in the face as well. They should also talk about that. <laughs> so, I mean. Do you think that had an impact? Because that's all come back up now after this, right? Yes. Do you think that that had an impact on Jordan Poole's play or just the Warriors' play as a whole? Yes, because one, they admitted it. They admitted that that had an effect on the whole team. Two, because if I am a young guy and I look up to this one player, not look up to like an idol, but like you're you're the leader. Of He's the a team. vet, right? You're yeah. a vet. You're a leader of the team. You're the voice of this team. Mm-hmm. And you punch me in the face. Anything you say after that is irrelevant. You and you embarrass me. It's not like you punch me in the face. Like we can fight. You know what I mean? We can teams fight all the time. Right. Like, closed doors. Like teams fight all the time. But if you punch me in the face, it gets out. I'm publicly embarrassed. Like that's gonna have an effect on my play. That's gonna have an effect on what if I'm gonna even listen to you moving forward. That's gonna have an effect on the whole team as a whole, the team chemistry. Like yes, that matters, and that that that's part of the reason why they had this up and down year and eventually lost in the playoffs. So I 100 percent think that that had an effect on Jordan Poole's play specifically and just how the whole team played as a whole. Because and Draymond can't be the same leader. If he's out here punching people in the face, it's like you cannot be that same guy that's supposed to rally the troops and get these guys going when it's, you're looked at as like, I don't know, this guy, not a bully, but like, you know what I mean? It's, you're just, you don't have the same voice in that locker room after doing something like that. Yeah. And I think the Warriors made it worse by not suspending him, right? Because then it, on yeah, top you don't of, get punished for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. On top of all that embarrassment, it felt like the organization was just like, pat on the hand, figure it out, you know, don't mm-hmm. do that again type of thing. As Jordan Poole, that would feel like a slap in the face to me. It's like, bro, again, it's one thing for it to happen behind closed doors. Whoever let the video get out, like that's a whole separate situation that needs to be dealt with. But at the end of the day, it's out. People see it. It's a bad, you know, it's bad optics for the organization. Mm-hmm. And it's even worse optics that it gets out and nothing is done about it. And they just like, it kind of gets swept under the rug and the season starts and it's just like never really touched on. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't like it from Steve Kerr. I didn't like it from Draymond. Um, just a, an interesting situation though. They continue again, like we've said so many times, their off season is going to be one of the most, I think to, to keep up with and watch with all the, the change in the front office. Um, now this kind of, you know, internal stuff going on there. Um, with the young guys. So 
I'm interested to see. I've seen people be, I think, really critical of Steve Kerr lately. Um, and some of it is definitely deserved. Like they think that he has gotten more credit for his coaching successes than he really deserves. And they think some of his philosophies are outdated. They think his biggest adjustment at times sometimes is say, well, dang, we'll just put Draymond at the five and go small. <laughs> and they're like, hey, small ball can't save every situation, you know? Uh, I think some of it is warranted, but um, this, I think, will genuinely be his biggest test, like this upcoming season, dealing with all of these internal issues, dealing with front office changes, and handling how this aging dynasty plays out into what the next generation of the Warriors look like. Um, because if you can get that right, you're setting your organization up for long-term success. Mm -hmm. If not, it's going to be bleak years ahead for the Warriors because you just go into a full-on rebuild that happens to a lot of great teams, but you had a unique opportunity to kind of extend that and sustain it longer. Yeah, I, I can't speak on the development part of the young players as far as him not doing his job. I feel like I, I agree with that. They're not doing a good job developing those young guys. But as far as, like, his scheme and everything being outdated, I feel like the players themselves are outdated. I feel like they're playing as if they're the same prime Draymond, prime Klay Thompson. Curry is playing like he's in his prime. That's him, him aside. But they're just – they don't have – we talked about it in, when they lost to the Lakers. It wasn't necessarily that Darvin Ham out coached him. It was the fact that the Lakers just had the proper players to make those adjustments, to make those lineup changes, and the Warriors just didn't. Like we said, Pool is was unplayable. They didn't. The Kaminga wasn't ready. Like Moses Moody, he played a little bit, but he he's not like a huge impact player. It's like they just don't have the roster to make those type of changes that should have been made. But that goes back to the organization not developing the young guys to say they do a better job of that. Then maybe they do have a Kaminga that they can just plug in and give them like valuable minutes. So, I mean, yeah, the the roster is, is outdated, but part of it is their problem for, or is their fault for not developing the young guys. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, One more thing I want to touch on before we get into to some of the, the draft stuff type, fun games we have at the end of the podcast. Um, FIBA basketball World Cup rosters um, starting to get put oh, together. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So I wanted to go through the players who have uh, reportedly committed so far to play for Team USA, who, for context, finished seventh in the last World Cup in 2019. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the defending world champion is Spain. Um, and the current list of stars, stars, because <laughs> not all these guys are stars. Um, I know one star that's on the team. <laughs> playing for, um, we're, we're already set to play um, in the, the basketball World Cup for the U.S. team. Mikel Bridges, Jalen Brunson, Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Halliburton, Brandon Ingram, Jaron Jackson Jr., Bobby Portis, and Austin Reeves. Yeah, AR-15, baby gun, lead us to greatness. <laughs> Represent the country, AR. Um, that's, that's funny. Yeah, all jokes aside, the, the young core that they have here, like, if they can stick together for, you know, World Cup and have a good finish going to the Olympics, like, this could be a nice new generation of USA basketball led by guys like Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Halliburton, Mikhail Bridges, Brandon Ingram, Jaron Jackson, Jalen Brunson. Like, that's a nice young core, you know? Yeah, for um, sure. So, I, I really like that. Um, Bobby Portis and Austin Reeves were a little bit of shocks to read at first, but, hey, you like that. You got to fill the roster out. It, clearly, like, again, they finished seventh in the last World Cup. People do not take this as seriously as the Olympics. Yeah. Um, but – uh, USA basketball, I swear, if, I swear it's cycl like cyclical. Um, like there's going to come a time where they're going to have one really bad loss and it usually comes at the Olympics. And then that next cycle, 
is like the, the next iteration of like the dream team, the redeemed exactly. team. Like <laughs> they're gonna put together all the big guns are gonna come on and be like, all right, we gotta mm -hmm. we gotta get it right. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, they, they go out and they'll stomp the next Olympic <laughs> So we're we're kind of reaching that point, right? The redeemed team was 08. Um they've had some close calls lately. Um, the last was some, year was kind of yeah, or the not last year, but the last time with what was it, KD and and uh, Tatum, Draymond, mm -hmm. all of them. Then they like kind of barely win. I don't remember. Exactly no, they had some close call. The international basketball scene, like I watched a lot of EuroBasket uh, last summer, going into this past NBA season, and those teams are like legit. Um. And the players on those teams who are in the NBA, like like it's always been, like when the, when some of those guys get to international basketball, like they are completely yeah. different than what you see. Yeah, over here. <laughs> that Euro basket run is what sparked what we saw from Lauren Market in this year, because he was on the Finnish team. Mm -hmm. Like he has the green light; he is the guy. And then, like all of a sudden, now he's in Utah, where they, he has that exact same space and opportunity to do the same thing. So he's going out, he's dropping 40 point games. So um, it, it's always interesting to see those guys go and play for their countries and um, continue to rise to the occasion as they have these new levels uh, or these new opportunities and roles um, on these teams. And so with the game continuing to grow globally, like I would not be surprised if that is coming very soon. Um, and we'll, they'll have to throw together another top, top quality team to go and, like, st stop out the competition internationally and kind of, like, reset everything again until, like, the 2040 Olympics when they lose again and we have to do this again. <laughs> but it's like – and we talked about this already. It's tough now because it's not – the best players in the league are not American players yeah. anymore. It's like I'm, – I'm looking at it right now. Jokic can't play. Curry is not going to play. He's old. Mm -hmm. Giannis can't play. Embiid can't play. KD's old. KD will probably play just because he's a hooper. Like, he just loves playing ball. Like, yeah. he might play. Tatum, yes. Luka can't play. Jimmy Butler does not care. Kawhi has no ACLs. AD also has no ACLs. Devin Booker, he might play. It's like the top guy, it's going to have to be the young guys. The young guys, guys. yeah. It's going to have to be Anthony Edwards. It's going to have to be Brandon Ingram. It's going to have to be these young guys that's coming up right now because – all of the best American players in the league, besides like Tatum, Booker, are like older. You know, what I mean, yeah. like thirty-four and up. So, it, it, it even if they want to do that whole next redeem team is gonna have to be with these young guys, and these young guys are gonna have to want to play. Yeah, they're gonna have to usher in a a new era um, of international basketball for uh for the U.S. because, like you said, the, the the stars who have done it in the past and represented the U.S. and the Olympics, a lot of them are at the point in their career where that's kind of a drawback, right? Like you're putting mm -hmm. extra miles on your body that you do not yeah, need. It's not worth so it. Trying to, trying to compete. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what this roster does um, that they have put together so far. Like I said, I think it's a lot of great young talent who – can really, if they stick together for, you know, a couple of seasons and continue to play internationally, they could really usher in something special um, and have a consistent presence, um, which is something that the U.S. Olympic team, I feel like, hasn't done since like that around like 06, 08, 2010, where like you consistently were seeing LeBron, you know, D. Wade, Kobe, like those guys were always playing internationally. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like it's always just like, who's available, who wants to do it. Whoever wants like, to, yeah. Pulling guys together. So you might be able to get some cohesion out of bringing a bunch of young guys in um, mm -hmm. and getting some early success that way. Um, wanted to go into um, a tweet that you had sent me, uh, which has four different point guards, and we're going to be ranking them at their peak. Obviously, this is all opinionated. I do not think there is a like horrible answer. It's an I do. <laughs> I do. I think there's a horrible <laughs> answer if you have this guy number one. Uh, so I'm going to list all four of them here. All right. So we're going to rank these four point guards at their peak. Russell Westbrook, Chris Paul, 
Derrick Rose and Steve Nash. I'm going to let you know right now. We're about to get killed because there is some stands <laughs> for some of these guys. Their confidence is going to be on. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. But if I had to rank all of these guys at their peak, for me personally, honestly, I might go Russ 1. I, uh, I've thought about it. That's, I like, that's what I'm saying. I don't think there's like – any of the like any of them being one because you're again like you're just looking at like the best year or years of their career. Like mm-hmm. Russell Westbrook's MVP season, he did something that hadn't been done in 50 years. Exactly. We, they thought it would never be done again. Mm-hmm. And led a team to well, they ended up being the six seed that year in a year where it was like just Russ and a, a bunch of guys, right? Like no disrespect. Exactly. To Obviously, Steven Adams on that team. All the depot. Right. That team was not a serious threat in the West at all. He was able to get them into the playoffs. And a lot of that was done on his back. Pat, crazy performances. That was the year he had the the 2020-20 game, right? Um, Yeah. So it's like he's doing everything on the court Mm -hmm. possible for this team. Absurd effort and energy every single play. Like, I don't think that would be a wrong decision at all to put Russ one. So I I think I go Russ one. Because, yeah, like you said, at peak, he was just insane, averaging a triple-double, a 30-point triple-double. Like, peak Russ was crazy. I think I might go Russ one. Now, number two gets interesting. And this is tough. And I am not – I will admit, I, Chris Paul growing up was my favorite point guard of all time. Mm-hmm. So, like, I might be a little biased. I'm not going to be mad if people put Derrick Rose two. But I think I go Russ one, Chris Paul, Derrick Rose, Steve Nash. Which Steve is Nash crazy. Last. Yeah, which is crazy because okay. Steve Nash has back to back MVPs, but he robbed Kobe and Shaq, so I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> I don't care, bro. I'm sorry. I guess it's when you're doing a like a discussion like this, where you're just talking about people at their peak, like accolades don't even factor. Right? I'm just the way I'm doing true, it yeah. is like I'm just thinking about like if I had to pick these players, like I don't care about. I just I don't I don't even have to know what they've done in their careers. I'm just looking at the best years, like what they were able to bring to the team on the court. So for me, I think I would actually put Chris Paul first. And again, some of that is probably biased. Like he is for a lot of people in our generation, like point God, right? Like he is the point guard (laughs) of our generation. Mm -hmm. Um, And those years in new Orleans, he was, he was special, different, was nasty, right? Handles are crazy. His court vision is insane. Playmaking is insane. That mid range still to this day is butter. Um, so I'll probably take Chris Paul one at two. Hmm. I've gone back and forth about it. Um, at two. I think I may have – it's really tough for me to pick between Russ and, to an extent, Steve Nash just because he his shooting splits used to be crazy. Like, he actually mm-hmm. was, like – he's an underrated, I think, three-point shooter. But, like, he helped – like, he just low-key was, like, a part – as being a part of that seven seconds or less Phoenix offense, like, kind of changed the way offenses run in the Mm -hmm. NBA. Like he single-handedly drove the engine for that team, which pushed the pace for all of the NBA moving forward. Um, And again, same thing, like his court vision, his ability to like lead an offense, his pick and roll play um, in its peak was like, that was almost impossible to guard. Mm -hmm. And we already talked about Russ. So, honestly, it's going to be tough. It's tough for me to pick between those two. Um, At their peak, though, in a vacuum, I'm probably going to have to take Russ just because, like we said, he was doing everything for that mm-hmm. Thunder team in those those years after KD. Um, just, like, removing the worst parts that we've seen from him in the last couple of years, like, 
that was a special time for him, a special time to be watching the NBA. Again, he was doing something that we haven't seen before in decades. People want to say it's stat padding, whatever, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, somebody got to get the rebound. It wasn't stat padding, bro. He was legitimately just hooping, bro. He was out there just killing people. Right. So, like, somebody got to grab the rebound. If you ain't going to grab it, I'm going to grab it. He was doing everything for that. He don't care if you're my teammate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, taking, I'm taking the rebound. All right. You're uh, not working as hard as me, bro. You're not working. It's not stat padding because if it was stat padding, everyone would do it. Like, if it was so easy to do, everyone would. Why hasn't it been done since Oscar Robbins did if it's so easy to average a triple double for like four seasons? I'm not. That's so dumb, bro. I'm not hearing that, bro. I'm not. Yeah. So then rounding out then at three, I've got Steve Nash. And then fourth, I've got Derrick Rose. Ooh. Um. Yeah, it gets, for that one. <laughs> it's not even no, it's no shade, obviously, to Derrick Rose. Like, no, nah, I know, I know. It's just, bro, Derrick Rose got some stands. <laughs> no, nah, I know. Derrick Rose got some stands I, out there. Oh, one of them, bro. Going back, like, I, if you, like, look any, like, old highlight videos, like, watch YouTube will pull them up, like, best announcer calls of all time. And it's like the Derrick Rose shot in that Cleveland series where he does, like, the stone face after he makes it. Yeah, like, no celebration. <laughs> right, like, like that. I have that call like burned into my head. It's like pre-injury. Derrick Rose was on a crazy trajectory. Bro, um, he was nice, bro. Like youngest MVP ever, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And uh, like was on a trajectory to be a absurd level superstar, like one of the greats. Um was an athlete that we've never seen was doing things from a point guard that we've never seen and like hard to replicate um moving forward like just that level of athleticism i would argue like a guy like russ is one of the closest things in terms of an athlete that we've seen at least from like pure verticality um and his ability to like attack the rim um so yeah, I'm like, bro, it's always going to be tough. Like I said, these lists are subjective. I'm not going to fault anybody for being, you know, picking people or putting people in a different order, bro. That's part of the fun of it, right? Like you talk about right. it. Everything is your opinion. There's no wrong answer. It's not like I said, I'm going to put – This is a test, bro. It's right, not I'm a, not a putting, pop quiz. Right. I didn't say I'm going to put J.J. Barea at his peak <laughs> over Derrick Rose. Like – it's yeah, a, I, I picked a two-time MVP in Steve Nash. It just mm. is it's opinionated. And this again, no shade to Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose is one of my favorite players to watch of all time. This is how I viewed the list. That's all it is, bro. People be taking it way too far, way too far. Somebody you know makes it well, go ahead, go ahead. I was say somebody in the Instagram comments would say that we had a wrong list with the the Sabonis in you know that 2016 I've one. I've seen that, like right. Bro. And I was like, okay, well, then what's your list? He was like, there's no right list. I was like, so it's a wrong list, but there's no right list. So how is it wrong? That doesn't make How is it wrong? How is my, our list wrong, but there's no right list? Like, bro, shut right. up, bro. It's, it's, it's all right. opinionated. If there was a right answer, it, it wouldn't even be a question for people to talk about, right? Exactly. That's the point. But it's it's just tough because in the clips, we don't have none of the context, none of the explanation that could make it sound better. we just be like, Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook, Derrick Rose, Steve Nash. They'd be like, "Oh no, these guys don't know basketball." Like, all right, you on, gotta bro. watch the watch. The, come to the Off the Glass podcast and listen, like, comment, right. subscribe. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm um, not gonna lie to you. I've been staring at this list at Basketball Reference, and I look. You want to change my answer? But I love Chris Paul. I really love Prime Chris Paul, bro. Like he, I'm, I'm just, the way I'm thinking of it. I picked Russ one. But if I was starting a team, I think I'd rather have Prime Chris Paul on my team. If I'm being I agree. honest, uh, I agree. I think in terms of ask, I think part of why I put Steve Nash ahead of him is like Russ at his peak. Like in even this, as we see in the best version of Russ, like he has to be the guy. It's hard, like he can't play with everybody. You put Chris Paul or Steve Nash in any system, and they're gonna be of like a key asset russ can go into a system and it just it doesn't fit and like that kind of becomes a detriment to the whole team mm -hmm. like you have to construct rosters a little bit harder around him versus steve nash or chris paul could play with anybody any type of way like they're gonna get it right you know you know what i'm gonna leave my list the way it is because 
the list is rank these guys in their prime, just their peak years. Like, who was better? If the question was which one you would you rather have in your team, then I would have a different answer. But I, I'll I'll stick with my list. I'll just let my list rock out the way it is. So. Yeah. But I definitely, if I had to choose, like which one of you guys I'd rather have on my team, it'd be Chris Paul, then Russ. Then I see what you mean. Like it's tough between the Steve Nash and the Derrick Rose. So yeah. Yeah, that one's that one's kind of a toss up, honestly. Yeah. Last thing I want to do on today's pod, um, got some word association. Uh, thought of this, thought about doing this last night. I think this might be cool. So, um, I'm gonna give you one word, um, and you just give me a player, current or former, um, that you think fits with that word. Um, we're gonna see, we're gonna see what some of your answers are. I got a couple of different selections here, so. Um, start off, you know, some easy words might get a little bit more difficult. First one is electric. Current player, former player, first person that comes to mind when I say the word electric. Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook, yeah. Can't fault that. Can't yeah. fault that. Too, too explosive at the rim. Um, next word, gritty. Why the first person that came to mind was Patrick Beverly? <laughs> that was the first person that came to mind, bro. <laughs> He's a gritty player. Gritty player does the That's dirty crazy. work. I don't even like Pat Bev like that, but that he listen, he's gritty. I can't I can't even fault him for that right. one. Right. Yep. Um, next one. Underrated. The first person that came to mind is just because he's playing right now is Jamal Murray. That's the first person that came to mind. Like, I am trying to think of, like, who I think is underrated, like, just all the time. Hakeem Olajuwon. Mm, talk about that. I just think Hakeem doesn't get the res- – like, I mean, he gets respect, but it's like – people act like – because originally, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be doing my own little top ten all-time list. Like, just, in, just to myself, I don't be, like, posting or nothing, but – and – Originally, I put like a Hakeem ahead of Shaq, and people like everyone I told that to thought I was insane. Like I'm like, bro, Hakeem is a two time champion. Hakeem is arguably the greatest defensive player ever. Mm-hmm. Like he has a case to be the greatest defensive player of all time. Definitely the best post player ever. Like he was a dominant center. Like I think he, I think Hakeem is underrated when you talk about like top ten list, top ten of all time. It's like some people have him outside of that. Like people and and people, I think the reason why I say underrated because I don't think people value defense as much as I do. Like whenever I make lists of like even best best players now, best players all the time, I value. There's two sides of the basket of playing basketball. There's offense and there's defense. For you to pass somebody that is also an elite offensive player and also an elite defensive player, your offense has to be like different, like generational type offense. Like Jokic, not the best defender, his offense is on another level. Like, this is him being an offensive engine. Steph, his offense is another level, so you can kind of look past the defense a little bit. So, like, Hakeem was an elite offensive player and arguably the best defensive player of all time. So, I think he's underrated. Yeah, no, look, you're going to hear no arguments out of me. I agree. Hmm. Um, Arguably, one of the – or some of the best footwork we've ever seen. Um, I think easily the best footwork we've ever seen out of a big. Mm -hmm. Um. So good in the post, they named a move after him, right? <laughs> exactly. Like dream shape. Exactly, um, bro. Yeah, dominant, dominant post player. One of the most dominant post players ever. Like you said, one of the best defenders ever. Has a case to be the best defender ever. Um, definitely, I think, does not get enough love for what he what he was as a player. Got himself two rings in the middle of Jordan's era. <laughs> yeah. Stole, Eight stole on ball. Jordan's watch. Eight on Jordan's like, you know, nobody apparently did that. No, nah, let me stop. Let me stop. <laughs> then, nah, look, he look. Jordan stepped away from the game. He took his opportunity real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Sna- yeah I don't blame him. Snag both of them. Snag both of them. And that's another thing. Look, bro, think about it. All those people who didn't win championships throughout that whole time Jordan was playing, because obviously Jordan, two three peats. Nobody was winning. The two years he was not able to compete, because I, I don't give him that much. Uh, like, I don't give as much slack for not winning that when he came back, Jordan, because he did come back for the playoffs. It's a little bit mm-hmm. different than being there the whole season. But those two years, Hakeem won both. Out of yep. everybody that had their chance, 
he took both of them. Like, and y'all had to, y'all had to know it was like, bro, this is the best player in the league coming off a three peat. He just retired. This is our time. This is our, right? exactly. this is our chance. And he took both of them. Like, yeah. come on, man. I don't think I, that gets talked about enough. I don't think it does either. You know who else is underrated? I'm going to add another one, too. I'm going to have an, technically three because I said Jamal Murray, Kim Olajuwon, Isaiah Thomas. Beat Jordan twice. Won two championships. Back to back. That doesn't get talked about. I feel like that does not get talked about enough, in my opinion. Like, I understand they had a good team. But I, I Isaiah Thomas was nice, bro. The original yeah. Isaiah Thomas was OD. Zeke. Zeke, man. Yep. Crazy. Next word I got for you, unlucky. <laughs> Chris Paul. That's <laughs> <laughs> Chris Paul, man. He just can't get a break, bro. Oh. Chris Paul cannot catch a break. He this man is always either he's hurt, his team's hurt, something happens, like. He's he's unlucky, man. Yeah, that's like, when I was typing it. I was like, in my head, this is what I'm thinking about is Chris Paul. <laughs> it's like, he just cannot. That hamstring fails him. The groin fails him. He just the one, the trade that got vetoed. That's just unlucky, bro. Right. Just, <laughs> what just, are the odds of that happening? Like, yeah, that's what I'm. That's just you being unlucky, bro. Like, oh, I can't believe he did that. Like, oh my god. <laughs> and you seen the interview he did now where he said that. It's people uh, talking to his his daughter at school, making fun of her, saying that his, her dad's never going to win a ring. That is so crazy. That's so foul. <laughs> That's so, so foul. messed up. That Out of so pocket. Messed up. What's wrong with kids these days, man? That's, That's crazy. Foul. Respect CP3, bro. <laughs> uh, next word I got for you is dog. Mm, there's a lot of players. The first one that came to mind is Kobe. That's the first person that came to mind. Just because, yeah. you know, mom mentality, that right. was, you know, everything. That's just the first person that came to mind. Yeah. Was going – I never forget the story. He said that, his, you know, his teammates wanted him to go out, party, club with him. He's like, I'll go. I'll go if you come with me. They go out, they club till mm-hmm. 3 in the morning. He's knocking on their door two, three hours later. It's time to go to the gym. Yeah, bro. He's they on, don't make him like that no more, no, bro. He's on a different, he's on a different level, man. They don't RP, make him like that. RP to the Black Mama, man. That is yeah. sick. <clears throat> um, last word I got for you, drip. I'll say Shay. Shay, yeah. Shay, Shay be dri- he, he be dripped out, bro. I ain't even gonna lie, bro. He be, he be hitting him with the captions too. Monday, bro, what do you ca- say? What? Monday to Sunday, every day is it was Tuesday. Something, it, it was something yeah. crazy, though. Shave, he be on it, bro. The IG be going crazy. I ain't even going to lie, bro. Yeah. I'll definitely give it to him. You follow League Fits on, on Instagram? Nah. They be there, like, some, some account, they're, like, they always be posting, what, like, player fits in the tunnels. And they do, like, a, a all-League Fits team, like, an all-NBA team at the end of the year. And I think he was, like, the League Fits MVP. <laughs> it's bad, he, bro. He be stepping, bro. I ain't gonna lie, he be stepping. I Not in them to... boost though. Them boosts is a dub, bro. That's nah, I'm straight on the boost. They need to dead them, them red boots immediately. Hey, bro, it's between him or Kyle Kuzma. Kyle Russell Kuzma, Westbrook, bro. They be dripped out, bro. Russell, Yo, Dylan Brooks, fits, bro. We getting the pod, bro. <laughs> we getting <laughs> the pod on that. You don't one. like the Dylan Brooks Stone Cold Steve Austin? <laughs> that off. was that was atrocious. Like. He should have been fined for that. That was bad, bro. Bro, bro pulled up to the interview in a bodysuit. We just didn't see the for me the bottom. <laughs> he had this, had this skin tight tank top on. Bro, that was so bad, bro. <laughs> he pulled up in a bodysuit. <laughs> uh, and then even bro, oh when he was God. he was like resting for the the last game of the season, had the he had the hair. Perm, he like had the Cat Andre Williams. That was a year. <laughs> he had the Cat Williams, bro. That was terrible. My man has the worst. That he probably has the worst drip in the league, bro. I'm sorry, because like Kuzma and Russ, they just be wearing weird stuff. Like his fits is just bad. Like they're just bad. Nothing else. Hey, I respect the effort to be for me different, and I ain't never seen nobody wear that. <laughs> that was terrible, bro. Bad drip, never, bad terrible drip. You know who bro. else got bad drip? Tim Duncan. He got the. 
<laughs> Timmy, he just got the dad drip. Like he got the yeah. like grilling on the cookout drip. Like <laughs> <laughs> and look, I look, I respect it because I know he don't care. He so don't. it's like, look, he wearing whatever he's comfortable with. So There's I a lot of time respect for it. A lot of times he had no shape up. Like he had no cut. Like my man's just out there. Listen, it, that, and it fits his game, bro. Fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I'm boring. Like I don't care, but the I'm just here. The bank is fucking, always open. The, the bank shot. It. I'm good. I'm going home. I'm living my life. I respect it. I really yeah. do. Terrible drip, but I respect it. <laughs> Jokic, I think is is next up for the drip. The the I paused my game to be here shirt is crazy from a grown man. <laughs> Jokic is, I think, just think he's a gamer at heart, bro. I, I think he want to just play games and ride his horses, which I respect. I yeah, respect. bro. But if you he out got... here dropping 40, you can't – listen, nobody can talk about my game. Nobody can talk about me if I'm out here dropping 40. Right. You could critique your lifestyle off the court if you don't show up. That's why Kyle, Kyler Murray <laughs> catches slack. DeAndre exactly. Aiden. Bro, I don't even – I forgot that this happened. You remember the article they put out about DeAndre Aiden – I think it was this offseason or the offseason before this one. No, what, what was it about? Um, bro, they say he plays Call of Duty like, bro, like eight, ten hours a day. Like, he be gaming, like, plays a lot of COD. You don't have time for that in the league. Eight hours, like, playing in your, in your free time is one day. Eight hours a day is crazy. He said he be gaming, gaming. Like, Kyler Murray level, double XP weekend drop. See, you Fantasy can't points drop. <laughs> See, you can't, bro. You can't be doing that, bro. If you're playing not up to par, bro, you cannot be doing that. I'm sorry. Like, you can play in your free time, but you don't got eight hours of free time in the league, bro. I know you don't have eight hours of free time in the league, bro. That's a shift. That's a nine to five shift. Like, yeah. bro, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. You could be That's in the crazy. gym getting you something, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You could have been lifting to be able to stop Jokic or something. You could have been doing something. You could have been working on that little push midi that you like to shoot, that little right. floater that'd be bricking. Could have learned to take a step and dunk it. <laughs> exactly. And stop laying the ball up. See, no, nah, I'm straight, bro. I'm good. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I like those. We should do those more often. That was yeah, cool. no, that was fun. That was definitely um, fun. MJ, you got anything else you want, want to do on the pod before we wrap things up? Um, and Nah, we can, we can end it. I'll save, I'll save this. Uh, I, I got a nice little game we can play, but I'll save it for the next pod because it's probably going to take a little minute. Right. Well, as always, this is the Off the Glass podcast. We appreciate you for listening. Um, if you've made it to this point, made it through the whole podcast, we appreciate you. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Even if you are on audio platforms, go, go on your phone, go on YouTube right now. I'll wait for me. Like, comment, subscribe. Cool. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. If you are on the audio platforms, even if, again, if you want YouTube, pull out your phone. For me, close the app. Right. Go to Apple Podcasts. Go to Spotify. Uh, pre-download the show drop a five-star review it helps us out a ton um, as always i'm billy uh, um, that's dame and it's been an off the glass podcast and we out peace yes yes sir